Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Well Church. How's everybody doing this morning? There we go. Well, yesterday I got a call from Pastor Dylan, and he said, hey, "Dude, you are up to bat. Me and Maddie um, are in the hospital right now, having our our second baby, and um, which is super exciting." And um, so, you know, the Bible says be ready in season and out of season. And so um, I had a little something ready uh, for this morning just in case something like this was to happen. But if you don't know who I am, my name is Jake Schmidley. I'm the youth minister here at the Well Church, and I get to pour into our students on Wednesdays and throughout the week. And um, man, working with students has honestly been one of the greatest joys in my life. Um, I, I love being able to talk to them and pour into them. And one of the biggest questions I get asked often uh, from students as they're growing up is like, what's my purpose, right? Like, why am I here? Um, I wasn't born 50 years ago. I wasn't born 50 years into the future. I was born right now, but why? What is it that God is calling me to do? And I remember growing up and asking myself the same thing. And truthfully, I still do. And I think if we're honest in this place, we still kind of ask that question. We may have our businesses and we may have our jobs and we may be secure in where we're at, but we ask, you know, God, is, is this it, right? Is this all that you have for me to do? Um, you know, one day I think about how I'm gonna get salt and pepper in my hair and I'm not gonna be super cool anymore and I think, well, what's gonna happen, right? Whenever I can't be a youth pastor anymore. Where am I, where am I gonna go? God, what, what, what is it that you want me to do? And the title of my sermon this morning is called Our Purpose. And the reason I say our is because when I was praying about this question, um, the answer that I got, I felt like it wasn't just for me. I felt like it was for all of us, this congregation and this body. So let's just jump right into it because I got a lot to say this morning. The sermon scripture is um, in Psalms chapter 23. And if you grew up in church like I did, you have probably heard this psalm quoted a jillion times. And if your wife is like mine, it's probably painted on a piece of wood in cursive somewhere, hanging up in our house as decoration, right? You know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. We have all heard that. But as I was reading it and I was thinking about this question, it's a different verse that popped out to me, and it's Psalms chapter 23, verses three, and this is what it says. It says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And if you have an imaginary mind like I do, I start visualizing scriptures when I read them, and I see Jesus standing in front of me, and I'm trying to follow him down this path. And I'm trying not to get distracted by this, and I'm trying not to get distracted by that, and I'm trying to keep my eyes focused on Jesus because he's leading me down this path of righteousness, but the end of the verse is really where it's at. He's leading me down this path of righteousness for his name's sake and not for mine, right? He's leading me down this path of righteousness, not so people on both sides of the road can clap and applaud and say, Jake, you're doing such an awesome job, man. What you're doing with the students, the, the way that God is, is using you, the things that you're doing, man, it's so awesome. But it's not so that I could get the applause, but it's that so he could get the applause. He is leading me down this path of righteousness for his glory. He is doing a work in my life for his glory, and he is doing a work in your life for his glory, for his namesake. And that's the focus here this morning is that we exist to glorify God in all that we do. It doesn't matter if you walk into the gas station. It doesn't matter if you sit down to have a meal at the restaurant. We exist to glorify God in everything that we do. And somehow, some way, we get this perspective sometimes that the world revolves around us. We think that we are the product of our own successes. 
My business grew because I did this. I was able to overcome my addiction because I did this. And a lot of times we try to put ourselves in the place of the work of the Holy Spirit of God, but we exist solely to glorify God in everything that we do. We can sometimes cling so tightly to the things that we gain while we're here in this earth. I was scrolling through Facebook the other day and I saw a real estate auction at a house right down the road from mine. And I was looking through all the pictures and there was this safe with all these guns and all this ammo. They were selling the house. They were selling a truck and a car and all this nice furniture, a lifetime of accumulation of things. And I couldn't help but think this man worked so hard, right? For all of this stuff and it's all going to somebody else. Sometimes I think we fail to recognize that everything that we have is gonna be the future of junkyards and garage sales. Sometimes I think we fail to recognize that once we go, um, what we really ought to leave behind is a heritage of faith and a legacy of faith that people can look at our lives and they can say, this guy glorified God in everything that he did and I want to be more like him. The beautiful thing is that we have the choice, right? We can spend our life uh, glorifying ourselves and basking in our own successes, giving ourselves the credit for everything that we have, or we can glorify God. And the beautiful thing is he gives us that choice. We have the choice whether or not to love God with everything that we have, or to live in the world and love the world with everything that we have. And I'm reminded as I'm speaking this that Jesus said, you can't serve two masters, right? It's only one, and he's a jealous God, and he wants all of our. And as I was thinking about all this and the Lord was giving me all of this, the story of Moses came to mind. And if you've never heard that story before, I'll give you just a little brief snapshot before we jump into some scripture, but Moses was a Hebrew. And he was born, the Hebrews uh, were in slavery. They were in bondage in the land of Egypt. And they had multiplied and multiplied. There was like a million Hebrew people and the Egyptians were forcing them to build their monuments and to construct their cities. And the Pharaoh got so fed up with them that he said that he was gonna kill uh, all the firstborn males of the Hebrew people. And Moses was born, and his mom tries to hide him as long as she can, but she can't hide him anymore. And so out of faith, she builds this wicker basket, and she puts him in it, sends him down the Nile. I can't imagine what that would be like. And down this river with crocodiles and snakes and all the things you can think of. And it just so happens, right, that he gets put into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter, who's a couple miles down the river, and she decides to raise him in the palace. And so Moses goes from being a Hebrew slave to bring a, being a prince in the palace of Egypt, knowing full well that he was a Hebrew living in this lifestyle of luxury. And as he was growing older and becoming a man, there was always a curiosity on the inside of Moses, and he wanted to go and see the oppression of his people for himself. And so he goes out one day, and he sees this Egyptian uh, slave driver harshly beating one of his fellow Hebrew people. And something rises up, inside of Moses and he attacks this Egyptian guy and he kills him. And instead of dealing with the consequences, Moses just disappears. He runs off into the desert to try to be somebody new, right? To try to do something new, to try to run away from his old life. So he goes into this land of Midian and he finds himself a wife and he has some kids and Moses' identity changes from a slave to a prince to a shepherd. And now Moses is out in the wilderness and he is shepherding a flock. And he looks over and he, in this cave, and he sees this bush that is on fire. 
It's a consuming fire, but it's not burning up the bush, would strike anybody's curiosity. And he starts walking up to this bush, and the Lord God calls out from it, Moses, take off your shoes, for you're standing on holy ground. And God and Moses start to have this conversation, and that's where we pick up in chapter three, verses seven. The Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering, and so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land that is flowing with milk and honey. And Moses starts protesting to God, saying, who am I? Like, did you not see all the things that I did back in my past? Like, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I, God, to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And in chapter four, Moses is still protesting against God, and he's pleading at this point, and he's like, Lord, listen, I'm not very good with my words, right? Like, I've never been, I'm not now, and even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. He's like, logically, this actually doesn't make sense, God, because like I'm not very good at speaking. I'm not very good at getting up in front of people and talking, so there's actually no way that you can use me to do this. And in verse 11, the Lord speaks to Moses, and he says, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. How could God use somebody like Moses? I mean, in some senses, Moses kind of betrayed his own people. Like he grew up in the palace, but he knew that he was a Hebrew. And he decided to stay and to live in this lifestyle of luxury. And the Lord's wanting to use him to go back to his people and to lead them out of Egypt. And and not only that, Moses took somebody's life. Like yes, it was an Egyptian slave driver, but nonetheless, he murdered somebody. And he didn't even deal with the repercussions of what it was that he did. He just disappeared into the sunset. And God still wanted to use him. He was confused on his identity from a Hebrew slave to a prince in the palace to a shepherd in the desert. And he was a terrible speaker. Like logically, all these things, when you add them up, they really don't make sense. How could God use somebody like Moses. There's three things in the story that I want to point out. And the first thing is this. The Lord uses the insignificant. In verse 11, Moses is protesting to God and he says, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm unimportant. Like, I'm actually not worthy of consideration for this task. I murdered somebody. I left my past behind. You can't use me, God. The definition of insignificant is too small or unimportant to be worth consideration. You can't use me. Like, you just can't. I'm unworthy. Do you not see the blood on my hands? But the Lord loves to use insignificant people. When I was 10 years old, my younger sister Josie was born. And um, when Josie was born, growing up, she had seizures. And what would happen is she would go into such, in in a fever in such a rapid state. She would go from like a 98, 99 to 103 in just a couple minutes and it would just send her body into a seizure. And I remember the first time that this happened, I was woke, my uncle who was a cop in the town I grew up in at the time, he woke me up in my bed in his cop outfit, right? And it's like two o'clock in the morning and I'm like, what's going on? You know, there's lights outside my window, there's a helicopter that landed on the street and I'm coming out, my mom is in tears and I had no idea what was going on. 
But my sister had had a seizure in the middle of the night. And I remember everything, you know, went well. And she came home and she was fine. And and I was too young to fully understand, you know, all the, all the medical terminology. But I remember asking my mom, like, what happened? And she told me that Josie had a seizure. And I said, well, what happens if it happens again? And she said, well, if it happens again, we are going to believe that the Lord is going to heal her. And you have all heard the expression childlike faith, right? I, I just believed what she said. I just took her at her word, and she said that if God was gonna heal her, then God was gonna heal her, right? And I remember it was like eight or nine months after that happened. My brother was at a baseball step, and I was, I think I was upstairs playing video games or something, and all of a sudden I heard this scream. And you know, like one of those terrifying panic screams that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And I run downstairs and my mom is holding my sister uh, in her arms and she's having a seizure. And she's foaming and her eyes are rolling in the back of her head. And it was like a, it was a very uh, intense uh, moment. And my mom is frantic, right? And she's, she's yelling like, go call this person and go grab this and go do this and go do that. And I don't know what it was in me, but all of a sudden I just said something. You ever just like said something and you're like, I don't know where that came from. But that's what happened to me. And I looked at my mom and I said, mom, where is your faith, right? Like, like you told me not too long ago that if this was gonna happen again, that we were gonna believe that God was going to heal her. And so I run into the kitchen and I call 911 and, and I get these things that she tells me to get and I come back and her demeanor's completely different. Her hand on my sister's head and she's praying for her. She's praying for her and I sat down on the couch next to her in just a matter of minutes, my sister came out of the seizure and the paramedics come and you know make sure she's okay but I tell you that story because I was completely insignificant to be saying that to my mom I was a 10 year old kid right in the middle of a crisis moment probably the last thing that my mom wanted to actually hear at that time but the Lord loves to use insignificant people to display his glory and to display his power the Lord loves to use the people the Bible says that the Lord uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God loves to use people that are marginalized, that are cast out. God loves to use people that the world looks at as unfit and deems unworthy because it displays his glory and it displays his power. And he loves to use the insignificant people because they know they have to rely on God. They have to. I'm not gifted enough. I, I, don't, I don't have what it takes to actually do what it is that you're calling me to do. So I stand up here today saying, God, I'm relying on you. There's nothing that I could do in my own strength, but it's everything that he is trying to do through you. The Lord loves to use insignificant people to demonstrate his glory, just like he did Moses. He was cast out. He was broken. He was running from his past. And the Lord still wanted to use him. The second thing that I want to point out in this story is that the Lord uses the inadequate. In verses 10, Moses is pleading with the Lord. And he's like, look, I'm not very good at speaking. Right, like I know you're trying to use me to do this big thing and like that's all cool and everything, but check it out. I'm not very good with my words. I I've never been, I'm not now. Even though you're speaking to me through a burning bush, I'm still not good with my words. I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. The definition of inadequate is lacking the quality or the quantity required. Insignificant for a purpose. Moses is being very logical, and he's like, okay, if you are trying to take somebody to lead a million people out of captivity, out of bondage, out of slavery, well, you're going to have to use somebody that can speak better than I can. I mean, this actually doesn't make any sense. I'm not gifted enough. I don't have enough leadership capabilities. I don't have, an, I don't have what it actually takes to do this. 
but the Lord saw potential. I remember when I moved here to Marshfield a couple years ago, and I got the phone call from Pastor Dylan to sit down and talk about what it looks like to be a youth pastor. And I gotta be honest with you, like, I felt completely inadequate. I, I'd never <clears throat> led a ministry at this capacity before. Uh, I, I, I was a drug addict for a long time of my life. Uh, I didn't have 10 years of sobriety like Pastor Dylan had under my belt. And so I'm getting this call to do this, to go into a town that I've never been with people that I literally don't know. And to start this ministry, like, how am I, how are you going to use me, God? It, it, logically, it doesn't make any sense. Like, did you know that, you know, I, I, I've been in and out of jail several times, and I used to be hooked on drugs, and how could you even trust me to do that? let alone wait till the parents of the students find out that I did that. How are they gonna trust me? <laughs> like this really doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And God spoke to me and he said, Jake, if you will just get out of the way, <laughs> if you will just get out of the way, it's not you, I know you can't do it, I can, and if you just get out of the way and you just let me have my way, if you just stay open and you stay available to what it is that I am trying to do, I will do something immeasurably more than you could ever ask or hope or think. I will take a life of brokenness, a life of pain, a lifestyle of addiction, and I will change it and I will use it to display my glory. I will use you to do things that you could have never even imagined. Just be open. Just be available to the call. I believe that there's some people in this place today that are in the same boat as I was. You're looking up to God and you're saying, I can't. <laughs> I don't have what it takes. And he's like, yeah, I know, but I do. I do have what it takes. See, we start to, we get this, we think that it's our gifts and it's our talents and it's our personality that puts us in these positions, but it's really not. And it has nothing to do with us. And it has everything to do with the spirit of God that is on the inside of us. He is the one that is trying to do a work through us. He is the one that is doing a work in us. And if we could just step out of the way and allow God to have his way, he will take those who are insignificant, he will take those who are inadequate, and he will do a work that you can never even imagine. And that's what he did for me. The third thing that I want to point out is that the Lord uses the impossible, uses us to do the impossible. In chapter 4, the Lord is speaking to Moses. He says, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord, now go and I will be with you as you speak and I will instruct you in what to say? He uses us to do impossible things. I've got news for somebody in this place. The definition of impossible is not able to occur, exist, or be done. Let me tell you how logical this was to exile a million people out of the land of Egypt. They had one of the strongest armies in the world at that time. And the Lord is trying to use one person to go back into his past and to lead them out of Egypt. It was impossible. There was no way. And everything that happened all up until they left was impossible. The Lord had plagues that came upon Egypt, things that were impossible. Turn the Nile blood red. They, they're running from all the Egyptian people and they come up to the sea and they're like, okay, God, like what's next? Like, I, I've done everything you told me to do up to this point. Like, what, what else you got up your sleeve? And he parts the Red Sea, and he allows them to escape. And the Egyptians were swallowed up. 
It was impossible. But the Lord uses us to do impossible things. The Lord wants to use you to do something impossible, something that is almost even unimaginable. Worship team, you could come up. Let me ask this question today. How could God use somebody like me? Like honestly. How could the Lord use somebody like me? Broken, defeated by my past. I didn't see, I didn't see any promise in the future. I didn't have any hope. <laughs> I was just trying to make it to the next day. How could God use somebody like me? How could God use someone like Pastor Dylan to come back into his hometown with the reputation that he had to pastor a church? How could God use somebody like that? How could God use Pastor Selena, a woman, to lead two campuses? And thousands of thousands of people have come to know the Lord through her ministry. How could God use somebody like us? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the Lord likes to use inadequate people. The Lord likes to use insignificant people to do impossible things. The Lord likes to use people like that so that way the wise people are left scratching their heads, so that way people can look at their story and they can look at their testimony and it points them to God. The Lord wants to use us to do immeasurably more. Some of you in this place need to get a glimpse of that this morning. God wants to use you. I don't care how unfit or how unworthy you think that you may be. I don't care what you think you've done in the past and the things that you think are gonna hold you back from the future because we serve a God who is bigger than that. We serve a God whose promises are yes and amen. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the end. And he wants to use you to do a work, something impossible that you could never even think to happen. If we're not careful, all these things the Lord has done in our life, we will take the credit for. Your flesh wants to take the credit for the work of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And if we're not careful, it's me. Well, the reason I'm free from my addiction is because I chose to stop hanging out with these people and start hanging out with these people. The reason that my business is so successful is because I did this and I did this and I did that. And our flesh wants to jump in the way when really it's God. Really it's God. It had nothing to do with me. I couldn't set myself free from my addiction if I tried. There was just one day where I was lost and I was broken and I got down on my knees and I cried out to God, help me Lord, because I can't do this on my own strength anymore. Help me God. Because I don't have what it takes. I'm not worthy for this. I'm not cut out for this, God. And he said, I know, but I am. And I want to use you to be open and available to however I want to move. Stand up with me, if you will. In the book of Romans, chapter 9, verses 17, the apostle Paul is writing about this very story that we are talking about here today. And it says this, for the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. Everything God does in our life 
He leads us down this path of righteousness for his name's sake. Everything that that he does in our lives, the work that he does in our lives, isn't so that way we could take the credit, isn't so that way we could get the glory, but it's so that he can. The Bible says that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And your story is there to point people to the fame and the glory of God. Your story and your testimony was designed specifically to help somebody that has been in a similar situation than you have to help them overcome the darkness in their life and to see the glory of God shining through you. So I'll leave with this question. Do you do everything in your life to glorify God? Do you do everything in your life to glorify God? Do you glorify God when you go to the gas station to pump some gas? Do you glorify God when you go into the restaurant? Do you glorify God when you come here to church? Do you glorify God when you go back home to your family and you talk to your kids? Do you glorify God in the communication that you have with your spouse? Do you glorify God in everything that you do? Because our one sole purpose of existing here on this earth is to glorify God in every single thing that we do. Sometimes we make it so complicated. God, am I supposed to do this or am I supposed to do that? And he's like, check it out. It's really simple. Glorify me in everything that you do. Obey me in everything that you do. And I will lead you down this path of righteousness. If you don't get distracted by the things on the left and the right and you keep your eyes focused on me, I will lead you down a path of everlasting life and you will walk in my will and you will walk straight into your calling. Our purpose is to glorify God with everything that we do. There's some people here this morning that feel insignificant feel unworthy. God, how could you use me? You know what I did a couple years ago. You know what I do. You know what I do behind closed doors. God, there's, there's no way you could use somebody like me. There's people here this morning that feel inadequate. God, I'm not gifted like she is. I'm not gifted like he is. I I get tongue-tied like Moses does. I can't get up in front of people and I can't speak. God, you can't use me because I don't have what it takes. He does. He does. And there's some of you here this morning that the Lord is wanting to use you to do something impossible. Do you want me to tell you what my impossible is? I have this vision that one day my family will all come to know the Lord. I have this vision and I believe deep in my spirit that one day it's going to happen. And if you just keep praying and you keep believing, the Lord will use you to do something impossible. What is that impossible thing in your life, sir? What is that impossible thing in your family? What is that impossible thing that the Lord is trying to use you to do, not somebody else? See, when Moses was talking to God, he was like, yo, I I, I don't have what it takes to speak. Why don't you use my brother? And I think sometimes we do the same thing. We try to push somebody else into what it is that God has called us to do. And he's like, no, I don't want to use them. I don't want to use her. I want to use you. I want to use you to display my glory. I want to use you to spread my name throughout the earth. I want to use you to change your family. I want to use you to redeem the lost. I want to use you. time of response this morning. Believe me when I say it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. He will use you. 
It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been because the blood of Jesus is strong enough to cover all of that. When God looks at you, he looks through the veil of the blood of Jesus Christ and all he can see is innocence. So as we go into this time, I wanna invite you to come down here and pray with us. I wanna invite you to come down to the altar. And some of you are gonna say, God, I know I've believed this way for so long, but I, I believe today that you want to use me to do the impossible. Even though I feel like I don't have what it takes, Lord, I believe that you can use me.